So yeah, so good morning, welcome, and I guess uh, hopefully you got through the, the session okay. My name is Bob Tierney, and uh, I'm a solutions architect and I, uh, with Red Hat, I should say, and uh, primarily focused on, on mobility. Um, Background-wise, I'm probably a lot like you. I am actually not you know, a certified UI, UX person. Uh, I've always been on the client side, client app development side. And uh, in a former life, I worked for a company where UX and UI were just beaten into me. And some of it stuck, pro st stuck. most of it probably didn't. But it's one of those things that I, I learned to appreciate. And so we, uh, when we were talking about sessions here. We thought it might be fun to see if we could just maybe have a session that wasn't enormously technical, but maybe a little tongue in cheek if you catch, the, uh, catch my drift on the title. But basically, start thinking about building apps we know we build complex things in infrastructure, but you know, can we consider the user and think about what they might be looking for too? I'll let Bill introduce himself. Yeah, so I'm Bill Novak, and um, like Bob, I'm a senior solution architect <clears throat> for Red Hat. Um, we're both responsible for mobility in the mobile uh, application platform at Red Hat. And um, similar to what he said, I'm, I'm more of like the finger painter. I'm on the front end. I enjoy being in Photoshop and Illustrator and other things. And designing uh, really just static content uh, imagery, and then taking it and creating the uh, client side. Um, I would also say this, I mean, this is, um, it, you know, there's not a lot of people, frankly, in here, but um, this, is a, this is an industry, specifically with Red Hat, where we have a lot um, of opportunity on the front end side to, to develop great user experiences. And I'd also say this, that, you know, from a mobile perspective, UX, I think, is the main reason why this has kind of proliferated so quickly and, in, 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 uh, immensely, <clears throat> and it's because Apple created this thing where you can easily consume the apps, it takes a second, um, you can launch the app, it takes seven seconds to figure out what you're supposed to do. They created this experience and our users ha now have that as part of their assumptions. So oftentimes many enterprises, they develop these incredibly robust backends and they're scalable and safe and secure. All of that is important, but I would also argue that equally on the other side of that connection to that back end is, you know, how do we operate these darn things to get the users excited about the apps that we've built? So I'm um, pretty passionate about that. And um, yeah, so I'll turn it back over to Bob, but thanks for coming today. So the first question is, is this really a problem? I mean, people are building apps all the time. Uh, as Bill said, it's not really that hard to do. Anybody can go out and build an app. And, and in fact, with all the APIs you see out there, it seems pretty simple. I you know, get into some design tool, I call some APIs, and you know, how hard could that really be? Um, but, but the problem is, again, on the, on the user side. So let me put that screenshot in there. Um, I found that a couple, about a week or so ago as I was building slides, and uh, I thought it was pretty funny because, I mean, this is the sort of thing you see in every presentation. It's an IT infrastructure, you know, uh, you see fairly typically. It's got boxes and lines, there's a cloud in there, and there's, there's a reverse proxy somewhere in there and databases, and uh, I mean, this is the stuff of an IT person's dream. You know, that this, they live for this kind of stuff. Um, I mean, maybe not for you guys, but I bet there's somebody out here at this, this conference that, that has this installed in their garage. Uh, that's the kind of things that you see. Um, but let me ask you the question. Could those people be less significant in this picture? They're stick figures, for Christ's sake. It looks like a hangman game. They're, they're meaningless. And in fact, everything about them is going into the system. There's all sorts of lines, but there's nothing in there that would indicate that the users matter here. So it's all about you know, populating our big engine and all our big data and all that. And, and I just, the point here is that we need to think about, we have all this great infrastructure, but ultimately the purpose of this is to put it in the hands of some user. Wouldn't it be nice if we took them into account so that we could start making sure that all this great information that we have uh, is, is applicable and useful uh, to the user themselves. So Bill and I are gonna talk a little bit about design and design. And you'll notice that there's one capital design and one's little design. <laughs> and just for fun, if you want to be, uh, be really focused on it, you'll notice the big design is done in courier font, and the little design is done in century gothic. That's what you see in all the magazines and everything. The reason we're doing that subtly is the big design isn't about what the user sees necessarily. It's how you, as a set of group of developers, approach solving an application problem for the, for the users. And this has to do with making sure that you understand the problem domain and going through the processes, basically getting a, a sense of what their world is like so that you can architect a solution for them. 
The other side of it is the UI side. That's the stuff that Bill was talking about that you know, he likes to do so much, at, you know, making sure the fonts are right and the colors and all that kind of stuff. And that's more on the implementation side. And they're both very important, uh, but, uh, but there are two things you need to think about when you're building an app. This is a graphic. Actually, I just pulled that this morning because I just happened to run across it. But it's, it's not a bad visual in terms of how you think about user experience versus user interface. Uh, user experience is much more about a methodology to uh, understand and define what the users are going to need before you even consider what you're actually going to implement. Does that make sense? This is a small crowd, so if someone wants to shout out something, feel free. So what I want to talk about is a methodology known as design thinking. Has anybody ever heard of that? Nope? Good. I got something new they won't know about. Impressive. I'm literally one day ahead of you. Uh, design thinking is a, is, a, is a methodology, it's an approach uh, to, um, to building and actually getting into the whole UX experience. And I w thought I'd go ahead and just give you a couple of definitions for it. So design thinking, what is it? It's a methodology for innovation that combines creative and analytical approaches and requires collaboration across disciplines. And I want you to take away those last three words. It's a collaboration across disciplines. If you're not including everybody in your organization as part of your design, your big design process, you're missing an opportunity. It's not about just having a spec and writing it. You need to understand everybody's point of view before you can actually build something properly. The second one is it encourages organizations to focus on the people they're creating for and leads to human-centered products, services, and internal processes. Once again, I want you to focus on two words there, human-centered. The key here is we're trying to build something that makes sense for the users. This isn't about satisfying an IT issue. Now, I'm sure some of you, this is all new, some of you might be thinking this, which I thought I had fun with. <laughs> it sounds kind of fluffy. In fact, my years when I was learning about it, I, I spent you know, days people telling things, saying things like rich and immersive and expressive and all these things. I live in Texas, and I can assure you if I talk like that, they'd shoot me. So, but, but they're important. You want to delight the user. It just all sounds so fluffy. But the whole point is we're talking about the user and how they're actually working and functioning. In terms of what a workshop looks like, this isn't your normal workshop. You're not going to be sitting at desks with your laptops. You're walking around. You're walking around with your peers, people you don't even know. Uh, you're smiling. Uh, you're not being lectured to. Uh, and there's lots of post-it notes. If you ever have an opportunity to go to a design workshop or even a, a training for a design thinking workshop, do it. You'll, you'll learn something. I learned something. I've gone to two of them myself um, as, a, as a student, and then I've participated in a few of them uh, as a, sort of a pseudo proctor. And I think, Bill, you've done a bunch of them. I yeah, think. similar. So it's worth doing, even if you just, just to understand what it's all about. So, did you want to, uh, so what is it? In, what, what is it you do? So actually, a five-step process. It, it's kind of like being an AA, but uh, you'll come up with better UI. Um, there, are, there are there are a few things you're going to do. There's a empathize. There's a define. There's ideate. There's prototype, and there's testing. Now I'm going to go through those real quick. The first thing you do is in the in the empathize is you watch and observe. And if you've never done that with your users, I encourage you to do that. If you've ever built an app. Go sit next to your user and watch them do what they, watch them use your app. Interact and ask questions. Now, this isn't a, a tutorial. You're not there for tech support. I want you to interact and ask them questions as to why they did something a certain way, not how they could have done it better if they read your manual. People do things in the applications because there's a natural flow to how they work. And you need to better understand how they work so that you can understand and empathize what their challenges are. Oops, excuse me. And that's an important thing. The challenges with any app are their challenges, not your challenges. So you're not there to solve a problem. You're there to understand their world so that you can come up with a better app later. And most importantly, of course, is listen. You know, listen to anything they say. Watch anything they do and take notes with that. Make sense? The next thing is um, in the process is defining what the problem is. And this one's kind of a tough one because it's really easy to say the problem is, you know, this button is in the wrong place or, you know, some fine-grained thing. But what you're really trying to do is come up with an abstract idea of what the problem is in general for these users. It's not so much the problem with the app. It's what are the problems of the users when they use the app. And, you know, I'm saying app. Everything I'm saying here could work, be applied to a regular application, not just a mobile device. You want to narrow your focus a little bit 
But because you don't want to boil the ocean. We're not going to try and rewrite the entire system. We want to find something that we can select that, that makes sense, is meaningful, would have some impact on the users, and then start defining that as a problem. Because this is the thing that we're going to might, might ultimately try to solve. We'll look for patterns. I have my phone being tweeted here, excuse me. Um, look for patterns of, of usage. You know, what, what, what sorts of things do they tend to repeat or what problems do they tend to have across the board of the app? Those are the general problems that you're trying to solve. Once again, we're not trying to fix a specific thing like a bug. We're trying to see how a user has problems in general with interacting with your application. You also want to not try to get into a, a too focused problem mindset. So I have a scissors versus cutting paper. It's really easy for someone to say, well, you know, I can't do what I'm doing because I need better scissors. Well, the problem with that is then the solution is focused on scissors. I need sharper blades or a better handle, all that stuff. But if you step back and think, what is, what is it you're trying to do? Well, I'm trying to cut paper. Well, now I have a, a, a bigger framework to work with. Maybe scissors aren't even applicable. Maybe I could use one of those things you sell, had in the art room. Find out what the problem is ge generally and then work towards a solution. Don't fix the issue specifically. Does that make sense? Okay. The, last, the next one is kind of the fun one because it's just crazy. It's the ideation process. This is where once we've defined the problem, how do we start approaching a solution for it? And the first thing, that's the question we ask, how might we solve this problem? What sorts of things could we do here? And the first thing I gotta tell you is, you're only limited by your imagination. In my personal experiences, sales reps do really well in this part because they don't care about reality. They just say whatever comes to mind. And, and I, I'm joking a little bit, but kind of true. Uh, but it is important to sort of free yourself of the, the bounds of reality. You're just trying to come up with a solution. Who cares if it's real? In fact, Engineers, I think, have the harder time in here because we have our, these notions of you know, parameters and you know, uh, statistics and numbers, and we, we tend not to actually do that well in the ideation process because we're limited by our thoughts about reality. But you're not trying to actually implement something. You're just trying to come up with a solution, any solution. In fact, they can be crazy, ludicrous, outrageous. They can be anything you want. Um, I was in uh, one session where, it was a couple years ago, and it was a, it was a fake, it was, it was a, a pretend design thinking. We were solving a, a sort of a fake issue. And the, and the issue was, how do we get power to Mars? Well, as an engineer, we were thinking, well, let's see, how much copper wire would it take and what would be the resistance to you know, go millions of miles? And some person said, well, why don't we outsource it to the aliens? Ridiculous. Ridiculous, but we don't know that they're not aliens, so maybe that's the solution. This kind of gets back to the having a diverse group of people. You might think something's ridiculous, but someone else might go, oh no, that really works. You know, you really can do that. Well, go ahead and sh just spitball, throw them out there, even if they're crazy or ludicrous, because someone else, it might just hit, hit, hit on something. And you're gonna do a lot of these. Um, you know, it wasn't that long ago when, you know, 15 years ago, someone in a design thinking workshop probably said, wouldn't it be better if we just talked to our phones? Ah, you're crazy. Not crazy anymore. So when you, when you define your problem, then as a group, what you'll do is collectively define which one you wanna use. And like I said, it could be the crazy one, it could be the one that, you know, that's delightful, the one that's rational, doesn't really matter, just choose one. Then you go into the next stage, which is prototyping. Prototyping is not about building the product. Prototyping here is refinement about what you're doing. This is basically to reinforce what your, what your solution might be so that you better understand what the problem is. And it could be anything. It doesn't actually have to be the actual thing. You could have a storyboard. You could have pictures, uh, you know, something, anything physical. So it could be telling a story that has a tactile. You know, anything tangible to help you understand and reinforce what you're doing from a UX or from the uh, problem domain is, is, a, is a good thing to do. And I, I say iteration. These are low grade, high volume. Make a lot of them. This is not you creating a prototype in the hopes of going to Shark Tank and getting funded. This is you getting a prototype so that you can better understand and also give to the end users uh, something to help explain how you think you understand their world. The last one is just testing it. 
And once again, <coughs> this, all you're doing is soliciting feedback. You're putting your thoughts into the hands of the of ultimate users so that you get a sense, or they get a sense too, that, that you understand each other's problems. Uh, this is not, you know, this is for them to use. So, you know, don't just talk about it, let them play with it. Whatever it is that you've prototyped, uh, they should be able to interact with it. You're gonna, if, you're, if they are interacting with it, then you'll get a sense of hopefully some more empathy because you'll see whether or not they, well, you'll see whether or not you understood their problem with how well they're using your prototype. Um, it'll also refine your point of view. And once again, iteration, do lots of them. You're gonna do lots of them. But all this time, the thing behind the scenes is you, you've gained, you're gaining a relationship with these users and other people. Uh, and you, again, the empathy and understanding of their world will help you build better applications. So in terms of what design thinking is, uh, you know, if I put, put a side to it, you know, we, we're very much user oriented. We're, we're focused on uh, you know, getting a specific thing fixed or uh, resolved. Um, we want diverse thinking. We want lots and lots of people involved here because it just adds to the adds to the mix and makes it better. Um, we'll have something that's fairly real world and uh, it's uh, iterative. I'm going to move. Um, Go ahead. Can we pause there? Does anyone have any questions? He's spoken obviously about the uh, the steps within design thinking. Does anyone have questions, comments? It seems fluffy, doesn't it? It's the roll your eyes, and I swear I did it too. I was like, this is just fluff. But once you've done it a couple times, particularly once you've been with a user and gone through the empath empathizing, you'll go, oh yeah, they didn't really get my application, did they? So it's really worth it, if only just for the interaction with the different folks, <coughs> it's, it's, it's worth it. Question from the striking young man in the back. Sure. <laughs> So it's, well, so maybe I should get, uh, go to the next thing. So, well, in fact, I'll do that. I'm going to talk a little bit about design. So this is now implementing, but that puts your picture back on the screen. It's like we so, paid you to say that. It's weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's a fair question. You know, how, you know I've, I've got this architecture, and maybe this is the, arch this, this is, this has been designed. And in a sense, you know, I'm sure it was done with design thinking in the sense that the user in this case is the, the IT organizations and people who are running accounting systems and SAP systems and all that, and they, they've been a part of that process. Um, the, thing that, the, the, the thing that's important is that the people who are gonna feed this system uh, aren't necessarily siloed to this app. They might be doing other things. And that's the important part is even though your entry points to this system uh, are important to feed the system, you need to consider the fact that they might be doing other things beyond your world. So the answer is always start both at the same time, if you can. You may not be able to. A new app for the client may be going against something that already exists. Um, but I just would argue that if you are going to build an app, it, you know, if you're going to build an app from a user's point of view, then go to the user first. Are you solving a problem for them or are you solving a problem for you? That's really the takeaway, is whose problem are you trying to solve? All right, so you remember this guy. And to, to that point, um, let me give you my personal perspective of things. This is the our IT infrastructure, and that's what I think about it. It means nothing to me from a user standpoint, personally. Yes, I might need to enter some data. Yes, I might need to know something. But what I really care about is what's in front of my face. Um, I don't look like it, but you know, I could be a millennial in this, this way in terms of my attitude. I care about what's in front of my screen. I'm glad that there's an API to help get, get what's in front of me, but I don't really care about it. You ought to be able to swap it out and put something else in there. I care about what's in front of my face. And in, in the UI world, a lot of times we refer to this as being in front of the glass versus behind the glass. We tend to build our applications behind the glass, and we shoehorn those big, giant, nasty IT architectures into an even smaller real estate than what can handle it. But that's not the focus here. The focus is in front of the glass. What's my problem and how can I be effective and efficient and delighted and all that sort of stuff and still tap into these sorts of things? That's the sort of thing that we need to think about. I, this part of the session here was kind of, you know, I, I was gonna start talking about theoretical things. It turned into a rant, so I apologize. <laughs> but nevertheless, 
we'll, we'll use the rant, because I just end up going through things that bothers me from a UI standpoint. Uh, so they're non-theoretical, but <clears throat> maybe they bother you too, or maybe they don't, but I'd sure love to hear. Uh, but I think in front of the glass, I think Bill does too, so, so these are the things I care about. One of the things that drives me up a wall, particularly on apps as well as, as UI, regular UIs, is it's just master detail everywhere. I'm pretty sure that I could go to any app and guess your schema simply by using the app. Because it's so easy. I have a list of things, and I have a form, and I have a sub-list of things, and another form. I mean, I'm sure within a week we could come up with some schema that represents your system. And that's great, and that's how you want your flow of data to go, because it fits nicely into your database. But that may not be how the user flows in terms of their processes and how they want to, to interact and exchange and, and do data processing. So just avoid that. Don't get into a habit of master detail on a screen because that's not how the user necessarily works. Is that a fair thing? Are you impressed that I knew what third normal form was? Okay, there you go. Was anyone? I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> of course, that, that assumes they knew what third normal form was. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking they do. Okay. All right, the next one is context. The thing that Bill was talking about at the phone is very true. I mean, yes, I might be using your app, but I might be tweeting, and I might be using my GPS, and I have an accelerometer, and I have all kinds of stuff. And this, this device, although it has a lousy interface as far as screen size, does a lot of things. It is the granddaddy of IoT devices, if you think about it. I mean, it's always on the network. It's got all sorts of, of, of uh, uh, sensors on it. I mean, I can do all kinds of stuff with this stuff, with this thing. One of the challenges for you as, as, in terms of building an application is to take into account context. What am I doing? Where am I doing it? How often am I doing it? All those sorts of things. And you can tell those things from this device. So it's not just a matter of shoving a screen in front of me. There's information that you can gather about me and what I'm doing because I'm using a phone. Some things are just implied. So I'm going to tell a little bit of a real world story. Uh, B of A site, just like any other banking site, nothing particularly great about it. It's very nice. I'm a B of A customer. If I wanted to, I could sit down at my desk and have a, you know, just a wonderful experience probing around, getting credit cards and doing my banking. So all good. In the, in the lazy world, someone could say, this, I'm gonna commit heresy here, ah, we could just use responsive design and put that into a mobile device. Wrong. No user that I've ever come across has ever said, this app is really cool because they used Angular and responsive design. No, they want you to solve a problem for me. Are we and good with responsive design? Does everyone kind of understand what that is? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, the point, the goal here is not to shove this website into, a, into the phone. The point is to solve a problem. And in fact, in my case, I actually don't do any of the banking. My wife does all of it. I hardly, in fact, rarely ever go on, online. Uh, but I will occasionally use their, web, their, uh, their, their app. And you'll notice their app does not look like their web page. There's only one reason why I use this app, and that's because one of my children has called, and they want money. <laughs> it's true. Just last month, I was driving down from Dallas to Austin, and my daughter was stranded at a gas station. She needed some money because she, she was out, and she needed to buy gas. I pulled off the side of the road. Thumb. Thumb. A couple more thumbs. And in a minute, I was back on the road, and she had gas. Context. What am I doing? Where am I doing it? I couldn't have done that on the web page, but I was able to do it safely having driven to the side of the road, stopping the car, turning the emergency signals on. I would never have done this while I was driving. By a show of hand, who really thinks he pulled over? <laughs> Nobody. Okay. That's important, though. I think context is a big key. So, yes, we can do things that are on the web page and put them on the phone, but does it make sense? You know, another example is uh, your, your, air, your, well, you'll see it a little bit later, later but, you know, any app that, that, your Starbucks, you know, your Starbucks web page, you, you know, when you're on the phone, you just want to know where the nearest Starbucks is. That's context. Has anybody heard of Don Norman? Okay. Don Norman, and I encourage you to Google him. Uh, he's a, a cognitive scientist, um, very well known for all sorts of design. In fact, he's attributed with the term user experience. Um, and I have a, a link, in the, or I have a reference to him at the end of the slides. Um, 
just a really great guy to listen to. And he's not about application design, he's about user and human design, those sorts of things. Uh, but he's got this thing, people refer to them as Norman doors. If you go on YouTube, you'll see, see people showing off Norman door, doors. And the, the issue is ambiguity. You know, what does a user do and what sort of visual cues do you have to, when, it, when it comes to you know, doing things and interacting with things? So I've got a little test for everybody. That's the picture of a door. Who says I should push? And who said, well, who says I should pull that door? Okay, vast majority, a few. Any, anybody want to stand up and say push? You say push, okay, <laughs> that's all right. Here's the other side of that door. Anybody want to change their vote? Should I pull or push? It's, well, what, and what happens is, Somebody's going to pull it and they'll be happy and someone is going to have broken teeth. So that's the problem. And the problem here is, is ambiguity. So as it turns out, they had an ambiguous interface and so they had to take up more screen real estate effectively by giving you instructions as to how to use <coughs> something as simple as a door. That's bad design or a, an opportunity to create better design. It should be more positive. Okay. So they're, they're great door handles, but one isn't going to work unless you have additional instruction. And that's where we talk about visual cues. Generally speaking, when you see a handle that you grasp, the general response, I'm not saying always, but the general response is that you pull. So that'll, that'll carry most people. On the other side of the door, if there is no handle, you have no option but to push. And that's the sort of thing, you, if you think about when you're building applications, was you're trying to lead your users to the right, to, down a path where, where they can be successful, visual cues can go a long way without you having to have additional instructions. Norman doors, they're cool. Um, this came in yesterday. Uh, who, did anybody da download the app? Uh, did any, the, yeah. some of that? Did anybody have a problem with the email? So uh, this, this literally got in my slide deck yesterday afternoon because I, along with a bunch of other people, uh, had the same problem. I, I, I downloaded the app, I clicked get the email, I clicked it in my mail, nothing. Did it again, you know, and what's that, that definition of insanity, doing something multiple times expecting a different outcome. So I know, I know most people were successful, but the problem was, if you don't know, is some people were actually doing their activation on their regular mail. So I, I, download, I literally was sitting here with my phone you know, and I downloaded the app, I got the email on my laptop, and I activated it from here. Doesn't work. The assumption was that I would activate it from my device in order for it to work. Assumptions. Don't make them. You see the weird error you got, Yeah. It's just, I'm not, actually, I like the app. I think they did a good job, so I know the interface is very intuitive and all. Uh, but just, <coughs> I just had to chuckle that as I was preparing for a UX thing, the very thing that we're doing for the Summit app was a failure in, in just on the install. The second thing, the next thing I want to talk about is data silos. We hear a lot about data silos, don't we, in the IT world? I mean, in fact, I can't imagine any one of our sales reps hasn't come out to visit you and talk about how your data is siloed and we're going to solve all this problem with middleware and Fuse and all kinds of stuff and this, the billions of dollars that we can solve on data siloing um, and so forth. So, and that's all good. I'm not saying, we, uh, you know, look at all our stuff. Um, I think probably the two most understood commands that you have on your laptop are this. I realize it could be command C, but, but uh, cut and paste, we all know it. How many billions, petabytes, gigabytes have been transferred just by using those two keys? I can't, I can't imagine. I bet half the internet data alone is done through cut and paste. I mean, I Google, pull Google Docs stuff down all the time. That's tons. And why am I doing that? Because I want to move something from one place quickly to another. Is it fair to assume that all of you have been in a situation where you're at your desktop and you have the same application up? And the reason you have the same application up is because you want to copy and paste something from one place to the other and you don't want to go navigating back and forth to do so? Is that a fair, fair guess? Okay. That's okay to do when you have a desktop. Not so great when you have uh, 
a, 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 a PC, uh, what are these called? Mobile devices. I forget. Um, so I'm going to give you a little example, and I've tried to redact who this is. They are a spectacular outfit, and they have spectacular technology, but I just, this one kind of cracks me up. Um, this is a, an app for an airline, and when I open up this app, it says, hello, Robert, and it tells me how many miles I have. That's great. Context is great. I love it. If I click the check-in button, though, this is what I get. Anybody care to tell me what's wrong? Yeah, they already said hello, Robert. They ought to know who I am already. But even if, you know, even that, it's like, okay, I can fill out my last name and first name. That's not hard to do. Who the hell knows their confirmation number? <laughs> anybody? Does any, can anybody here name their confirmation number on the, for their flight home? No. So the takeaway there is I don't want to be human middleware. Human middleware, bad. If you know something about me, use it and apply it, okay? Because I can't spend the time going in and out of the apps to do that. The next one is my favorite, <laughs> accessibility. Accessibility is, of course, a much, much broader topic, but I like to focus on one area because I have a problem. I am off the charts, and I kid you not, I am off the charts colorblind, as are measurably 10 to 20% of the male population. And most people who are colorblind are colorblind between with red, green, and brown. Do I need to say anything? Can anybody even read that? Imagine what it's like for me. I get what they're doing. This happens to be a, a, a menu for a, an Italian restaurant. So I think they were going with the Italian colors, red and green, I guess. Uh, but I can't read it at all. Okay. Also, there's a little bit of ambiguity there. Do I touch the red thing or do I touch the little arrow thing? And oh, by the way, it doesn't matter because they're actually the same thing, but they have them segmented anyway. So it's very confusing, if not just completely unreadable. Uh, be mindful of the fact that even though some things look cool, they may not actually present well on the device. And, and ask a friend. This is like, you know, who wants to be a millionaire? You know, phone a friend. Uh, I phone him every day. Can you even see that? And then after he <laughs> chuckles that my blue Just was, like that, yeah. my blue was really <laughs> lavender, you know, I go back and fix it. So ask somebody else because even though you see it properly, somebody else may not see it or might interpret it differently. There are apps for this. In fact, I go this place all the time. You pick one color. In fact, from, from a branding standpoint, this is my favorite thing. I can go to any one of your sites and pick a color, and it'll give me a list of complementary colors to choose in hex format so that I can uh, apply them. There's all sorts of tools out there from a color standpoint and scheming and branding. Uh, I encourage you to use them. Please don't do that. The last one I think is kind of fun, <laughs> and this kind of gets back to what we're saying, is, is you know, even though you built and designed something, that doesn't mean that's how the users are going to use them. Users are going to go down the path of least resistance because they're trying to solve their problems, not your problems. And they want to do things the way it makes their life more pleasant and easier and solve their problems. So expect that. And in fact, this kind of goes back to our, the beginning conversation, which is you know, maybe talking to the users and asking what they think and uh, bringing them in. So a couple of things here. Lots of drill up, drill down things. They tend to be tedious. So give me, a, give me an opportunity to go home or get around and navigate without having to go up and down so much. Uh, I might want to change my context. What I'm doing uh, right now might need to change quickly. Give me an opportunity to do that. And always remember, I'm using my thumb. I'm only using my thumb. Well, I have two thumbs. If you remember that, then that'll give you a sense of, of, of restrictions there. And lastly is I want to talk about complex data entry, which goes back to my whole thumb thing. This was a screenshot from someone's form filling out, form filling out, application, data application, <laughs> name, address, phone number, all that kind of stuff. First of all, look how small it is, and look how much data I have to enter with my thumb. Oh, did I do that right? I, I blew up one side of the screen there. Can you imagine having to type that while you're driving and eating a hamburger? I mean, it would just be horrible. <laughs> it's just tough. You know things, and if you know things, take advantage of it. So for example, if I know the zip code, aren't those two fields implied? If 
if I know the zip code, I don't need the city and state. I just enter the zip code. I've just saved this person a bunch of typing. And oh, by the way, if I ha am going to give them a zip code, you may or may not know this, but you can actually choose the keyboard that you want so that if you're only going to enter numbers, you can actually give them a number keyboard so that they don't have to switch the numbers and you know, mess things up. Make sense? But is there a better way to do this yet rather than just doing the zip code? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to propose that we use design thinking. See how I circled that back? That's good speaking. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is we're going to go through a little design thinking process here. Uh, I want to, the problem is data entry is difficult on devices. Would you all agree with that? I, I have, I've, I've, I, do you sympathize and empathize with me? Because I know you have all do it. S more specifically, one of the problems is apps often ask for my address. So this is the problem definition. I'm not fixing a specific bug, but the problem here is addresses are a lot of texting and it's tough to do on the phone. What could I do about that? Well, I'm going to ideate. And one of my crazy ideas is why should I have to type anything? Why can't I just touch the location on a map? Wouldn't that imply my address? Uh, disagree with me. I just, I'm curious what you think because I'm actually thinking about building this as a demo. In fact, I have my prototype right here, I think. So if I do this right, if I double tap and double tap and double tap, I get drilled down. So maybe there's a solution there where I don't have to type anything, but I literally could touch on the thumb and get to the location and say, that's where I live. It would give me a geolocation. And then at which point in time, my address is implied. I don't have to fill out anything. Tap, tap, tap. Just use my thumbs. All right, so with that, I'm going to close. I'm right at 11, so that's good. I didn't go over. If you are interested in any of this, obviously, we're happy to talk about it. A couple of things. I mentioned Don Norman. Um, he's got a book called Everyday D Design of Everyday Things. I got, you got to like the, uh, the teapot. Um, not a great user experience there. And then uh, if you want to just do a, a get something that's a small, it's like an eight-pager, and I will say that a lot of what I was talking about here comes from this. There's a PDF that you can download called an Introduction Design Thinking Process Guide. It's very easy. It's like I said, it's a very simple thing. It's, uh, it's done by the Stanford Institute. It's by Hassel Plotner uh, has a, has an institute. Do you guys know who Hassel Plotner is? He's one of the founders of SAP. And I love this because the SAP is notoriously bad on user interfaces. So kudos to him for actually setting up an entire college on how to improve people's experience because even they know that, that it's difficult and complicated. And with that, I'll just say thank you. And you know, we've got a few minutes if you have any questions. I hope it was somewhat informative. And